Dear friends, welcome to what will be a great evening at Temple Emmanuel. Before I introduce our honored guests, I want to thank our program committee, chaired by Dr. Claudia Platel, aided by our administrative vice president and Skirball Center director, Dr. Mark Weistuck, our administrator, Mark Heitlinger, our librarian, Liza Stabler, and tonight by our museum curator, Warren Klein. The images that you were enjoying a few moments ago are of posters featured in an upcoming exhibition which opens on May 5th at 6 o'clock at our Herbert and Eileen Bernard Museum of Judaica. Titled Justify Your Existence, this exhibition will feature the graphic poster as a call to Jewish social action. The artists who created and designed these posters endeavored to address a broad array of social issues, especially those which occupied the consciousness of Jewish activists in the first half of the 20th century. Drawn primarily from the years between World War I and World War II, these posters called upon Jews to respond to the important issues of the day, and that message is, of course, what this evening is all about. Tonight, we are continuing our series on the history and future of Reform Judaism, a series that was kicked off for us so wonderfully by our Rabbi Emeritus, Dr. Ronald Sobel, here with his beloved Joni, back in October. And tonight, we're going to explore with Rabbi David Saperstein and Al Vorspan social justice as the heart of the past and future of our reform movement. Growing up, I clearly recall that there were certain individuals whose names, when spoken in my house, were spoken with nothing short of reverence. Now, in some homes, those names might have been Ruth or Gehrig or Mantle. But in my home, they were Vorspan and Saperstein, power hitters for justice and they have been my heroes ever since. No one has ever championed Judaism's commitment to social justice more passionately, more eloquently, or more tirelessly than Al Vorspan. Al is the Senior Vice President Emeritus of the Union for Reform Judaism and Director Emeritus of the Commission on Social Action of Reform Judaism. He was integral in the establishment of the Religious Action Center our movement's social policy arm in Washington, which Rabbi Saperstein now directs. Though formally retired, Al remains deeply committed to the work of our movement, and its leaders depend on his counsel. He has served as the Union for Reform Judaism's representative to the United Nations and as national co-chair of the United States Interreligious Committee for Peace in the Middle East. And currently, he teaches with another Rabbi Davidson, my dad, who is also here, the importance of social justice in the rabbinate to students at the Hebrew Union College downtown. Al has long been and remains a leader in the ongoing struggle for civil rights, the peace movement, and interfaith activities. In 1984, he was the recipient of the Allard Lowenstein Memorial Award given by the American Jewish Congress in recognition of his contributions to social justice and human rights. In 1987, he was honored by the reform movement with its highest award, the Maurice N. Eisendrath Bearer of Light Award in recognition of his work toward social justice. And in 1988, he received an honorary doctorate from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. His articles have appeared in countless papers and periodicals. He has authored a number of books on Judaism and social justice, as well as on Jewish humor. And in many ways, it is his delicious sense of humor that has enabled those who have followed him into battle against the most difficult social realities to bear up and keep up, even under the most trying circumstances, the sacred fight. Born in St. Paul and a graduate of New York University, he served as an officer in the South Pacific in World War II. And when he came home, he married his wonderful Shirley, who is here, and they have four children and seven grandchildren? Eight. I've traveled through Eastern Europe with both of them. And I'll never forget the first time that I heard Al speak. 
It was in 1985 at Reform Judaism's Biennial Convention in Houston. I was so inspired by his talk that when he was done, I decided that when I grew up, I too wanted to be bald. <laughs> he is a true gibor, a true hero. My greatest source of pride in the rabbinate is being Emmanuel's senior rabbi. But behind that, and not far behind, is my association with the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism and its extraordinary director, Rabbi David Saperstein. The RAC, as it is called, has shaped the ideological vision of our movement like no other institution in Reform Jewish life. Some of you know of the RAC because your high schoolers have participated in its seminars, learning about issues pending legislation on Capitol Hill, and then advocating on the Hill for those positions about which they feel most passionately. When you consider our own synagogue's social action efforts, and I want to acknowledge that Linda DeLott and Carol Hess are here, two of the co-chairs of our Tikkun Olam committee, when you consider the work that we do, from mitzvah day to such interfaith worship as we shared over the King holiday with the Abyssinian Baptist Church, the truth is you won't find an initiative whose prototype was not envisioned in the halls of the rack. And not only do David and his tireless staff provide programmatic resources to make such congregational opportunities possible, David speaks as our movement's voice before members of Congress and the administration, championing our commitment to a wide array of social concerns. Just recently, a reporter pointed out to David that he has been representing a national religious denomination in Washington longer than anyone else still standing. And on September 8th, he marks his 40th year at the helm of the Religious Action Center. And his leadership extends far beyond our movement. In 2009, he was selected by Newsweek as the most influential rabbi in the country. And over the four decades of his leadership, he's headed several national religious coalitions, including the Coalition to Preserve Religious Liberty, comprised of over 50 national religious denominations and educational organizations. In 1999, he was elected the first chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, created by a unanimous vote of Congress. And he served on the boards of numerous national organizations, including the NAACP, People for the American Way, the National Religious Partnership on the Environment, and the World Bank's World Faith Development Dialogue. In 2009, he was appointed by President Obama as a member of the first White House Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Also an attorney, he teaches seminars in First Amendment, church-state law, and in Jewish law at Georgetown University Law School. Rabbi Saperstein is married to an award-winning journalist, Ellen Weiss, and they have two sons, Daniel and Ari. Together, David and Al, authored an important book titled Jewish Dimensions of Social Justice, Tough Moral Choices of Our Time. Simply put, Al and David are the primary reason why when people speak of Reform Judaism today, they speak of our foundational commitment to social justice and our thoughtful engagement in most every pressing social issue of our time. In the constellation of our movement, they are our guiding lights, and it is a great joy to welcome to Temple Emmanuel Al Vorspan and Rabbi David Saperstein. What do you say after that? Good night. Shorter and I are delighted to be here tonight. Uh, we're delighted to be here at what we see as an historic shidduch between one of the great synagogues in, in the history of America and one of the great young rabbis destined for greatness in his rabbinate. As Josh told you, we go back a long, long way before, before he aspired to be bald. <laughs> I 
Josh's father and I teach a course at HUC uh, on social responsibility and social justice. And one of the best young students we had was in our first class. That was Josh Davidson. And I knew then that this guy is not only going to be a tremendous rabbi, <coughs> but is a tremendous mensch. So it's a, it's a great honor to be here and to be among many who predict that this rabbi is going to be one of the great rabbis in America. But I also want to qualify that by saying becoming a great rabbi also has a downside, not all upside. I come from the Midwest. Josh told you that. The Davidsons came originally from Kansas City. I came from St. Paul. We knew some giant rabbis. One of them, one of them, whose name I'm not going to recite tonight, was legendary. <coughs> and one night in a uh, snowstorm, the kind we've been having here month after month after month, brings me back to Minnesota, but in a snowstorm, this great rabbi was greeted in the, uh, in the reception period by a young man he'd never seen before who gave him a big hug and said, I drove 200 miles to be here tonight because it's your inspiration that makes me want to become a rabbi. I never heard you before and I'm absolutely overwhelmed by your sermon. But I want to ask you one question. And the question is, besides that sermon, what else do you do? <laughs> the rabbi put his bear hug around this young kid and said, young man, I want to tell you something. You don't want to become a rabbi. You want to become a temple president. Now get out of here. Thank you, David. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of social action in Reformed Judaism. Josh has already told you a lot about it. I spent my, most of my service with the Union of American Hebrew Congregations right across the street in that great and gracious building that I pine for every day. I miss it terribly. I remember sitting and looking out of the window of that building early in the social action days and seeing a delegation of ruffians, Jewish ruffians, Jewish bozos from the Jewish Defense League standing on the sidewalk of Temple Emanuel threatening this congregation with bats and chains. We've had our excesses too in, in, uh, in Judaism. But I also found in that building across the street a man who was a giant of justice, who inspired me. His name was Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath. He was president of the then Union of American Hebrew Congregations. And the moment I met him, I found this, this is a man with a vision. His vision was that Reform Judaism can change America. Reform Judaism can help bring justice to America. That our congregations can help resolve the terrible problems which are tearing America apart. He was not the first guy to think this. There were members of his board who would get up at every biennial and say, listen, the Central Conference of American Rabbis takes positions on great issues in American life. They fight on some of those issues. They're alive. Where the hell are we? We're not an ecclesiastical body. We don't delegate our social justice requirements to the rabbi. What is incumbent upon the rabbi is incumbent upon me as a layman. What does this union do about social justice? And Eisenhower said, you're right, I've been dreaming of this for years, and I'm going to do it. I'm going to create, with your permission, the Board of the Union, a Commission on Social Action. 
Next hand that came up and said, maybe that's a good idea, but not now. We're talking about the early 1950s. Not now. Civil rights is tearing this country apart. And more ominous than that is the threat of McCarthy and McCarthyism. You open your mouth in this society, express a strong view, tomorrow you could be destroyed by labels. Communist, pro-communist, you could be followed around by the House on american Activities Committee. Young people in the congregation tonight don't really fathom what I'm talking about. Older people do. It was a period of nightmare. I was never called before any committee. I never felt that last myself, but I remember I couldn't sleep at night because professors that I knew, clergymen that I knew, were being persecuted because they had a view that Senator Joe McCarthy thought was un-American. I am proud of the fact that there was a public opinion poll during that period when Eisenhower was pushing for a social action program. The poll said, what is your religion? <coughs> How do you feel about McCarthy? I remember the numbers. They stick in my head half a century later. An overwhelming majority of the American people, Protestant and Catholic, said McCarthy's a great American doing a great service to America. 85% of the Jews said, the man is a menace. A menace to our liberties. A menace to America. Not a menace because he was an anti-Semite. He wasn't an anti-Semite. He was everything else. An alcoholic. Everything else. Not an anti-Semite. And I used to become sick to my stomach, to be blunt with you, when Jewish organizations would honor Joe McCarthy and the two Jewish salesman he had working for him named Cohen and Schein because they said, <coughs> the Jewish organization said, look, he doesn't like, he's not an anti-Semite. Why should I be against him? Well, Eisenbach didn't like that <coughs> answer and neither did this movement like that answer. And we created, forgive me a minute. <coughs> we created a commission on social action, which I was honored to serve for decades. It's hard to remember that in the early 1950s, in the social action program of Reform Judaism, defense of Israel was not even the top priority. Everybody was delighted there was an Israel. I more than most, because I had been a Zionist from youth. But that was not the big issue. The big issue was civil rights, separation church and state, a noxious American immigration policy built on Nuremberg laws, genocide convention to prevent Jews from being slaughtered, anybody else too, again. <coughs> Those were the top priorities. For me, the acid test of whether we meant business or not <coughs> was civil rights. Josh told you I served in World War II. I was on a ship in the Pacific that got blown up by a kamikaze. But on my ship and every other ship of the American Navy, fighting against Nazism and Japanese dictatorship. The black kids on my ship were not allowed to go anywhere near a gun. During battles, their job was to stay in the wardroom and make sandwiches for officers like me. I hated it and knew it could not stand. And the reform movement, to my everlasting gratification took a stand on the issue of civil rights. And there was a period not well remembered by most Americans when the key to the coalition for civil rights in this country, the crucial elements were blacks and Jews. Blacks and Jews. And not only Martin Luther King, who was kind of glorified 
in, in such measure that everybody else is bleached out, but the NAACP. And the NAACP helped with us, the Jewish community, to create the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights, which is the body that wrote the civil rights laws, which are the laws of this land. They were written in our building, in the Religious Action Center, on our conference room table. They were drafted by black and Jewish lawyers sitting together. They represented a triumph of religious groups and civic action groups who were able to touch a chord of decency and harmony in the American people at a time of great difficulty. The biggest fight that I ever participated in was not even World War II, this was bigger than World War II, was the fight to create this religious action center. It was very controversial. And I don't want to pretend everybody loved the idea. Many people in this very congregation did not like the idea. They, they, in this congregation, they had a tradition of generosity, of giving, of cooperating with civic agencies, of doing good in the community, but they were not happy about a religious action center in Washington. Somebody showed me a paragraph which I'm going to read to you. It's a paragraph about the history of this congregation, which places their role in some perspective. This, the premier chronicler of Jewish history in 1862 said that Temple Emanuel of New York City is the most charitable in all America and many of its members are much interested in noble and superior matters. It is, as I've convinced myself, the only congregation in America that is distinguished by both of these characteristics. But despite that glorious history and its present commitments too, they're very nervous about the creation of a religious action center, and so are many others. They were afraid that it would be, that it would run amok, that it would become a partisan political steamroller, that it would not be connected to the congregations and responsive to the congregations. All of those fears were dealt with. All of those precautions were taken. And I'm very proud to tell you what uh, David could tell you in more detail, but I don't want to give him any more of my time. Uh, every one of those congregations that raised concerns during the fight over the Religious Action Center. Every one of them today, including this one, today has warm relationships with Saperstein, with the Religious Action Center, with the Reform Movement, and especially with the projects of social concern that have been sponsored by the RAC and which now are legendary in Reform congregations around the country. This movement bet its future on social justice. This movement bet its future that we could be a serious partner to social justice and social change in America. And we achieved that in civil rights. We achieved that in separation of church and state. We achieved that in throwing out the McCarran-Walter Immigration Act. Now we got to throw out the new one and get another one. We were serious partners in the fight for social justice, and we are today as well. I mentioned McCarthy before, and I mentioned McCarthyism before, because I, after all these decades, I still quiver. But the echoes of McCarthyism still remain not only among the usual extremists in American life that I don't have to identify or anything else, but even within our community, and it scares me. It scares me because needed debates, necessary debates, 
about Israel and Israel's policy and Israel's relationship to us, all of those things are legitimate discussion concerns for American Jewry. And the moment American Jews say, and I don't care whether they're on this side or that side, I don't care whether they're on the left or the right, the moment they say, you cannot say that because that proves you're a self-hating Jew. You cannot say that because that proves you are anti-Israel. Or contrary-wise, you cannot say that because you have joined the enemy. There's a debate. A debate is difficult. The Israeli people know it better than we. They debate it every day. And they face these real dilemmas every day. We have to grow up as a Jewish community. We have to grow up, even when it comes to the things we care most about. And this is one of the things that I'm deeply concerned about. I want to close by saying that if you look back at the history of, of the reform movement in the last century and the first part of this century, we have lots of Taurus and lots of problems. And all you got to do is read the studies you have done it already, that indicate the dangers that we face as a Jewish community. But everybody, regardless of where they come from, affirms a belief and a faith that to be a Jew means to care. To be a Jew means to do something about things that are tearing us apart. To be a Jew means to stick your neck out a little bit. Jerry Davidson and I used to always recite this line Somehow, I took possession of it. They don't let Jerry use it anymore. Behold the turtle. It makes progress only when it sticks out its neck. <laughs> we stuck out our neck. We gotten beat up many times. But we have proved to ourselves, to America, and to young generations that it means something. It is significant to champion the prophets. The prophets didn't die thousands of years ago. They live. Their spirit lives. And this reform movement has kept that spirit alive, and I'm very proud of it. And the best thing I ever did at the Union of American Hebrew Congregations in over 50 years of service was to select Rabbi David Saperstein as the director of the Religious Action Center to hold that torch of justice and decency and conscience for generations to come. Thank you very, very much. As you may infer, Al Vorspin has been my hero for my entire life. Um, the most eloquent spokesperson for Jewish social justice of our generation. And uh, really an extraordinary, inspiring figure. Um, he remains such uh, today, and it's always an honor and a pleasure uh, to, uh, to be with him. He just celebrated his birthdays on Lincoln's birthday. Um, I won't tell you what milestone birthday he just uh, celebrated. I will only point out that he and Lincoln went to school together. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, it is uh, a, a delight to be with Alan, a delight to be with so many of you here. Um, in Jerry Davidson and Rabbi Ron Sobel, who are here, we have two of the truly Gedolei Hador, the great ones of that generation of the American rabbinate. I'm really honored and pleased to be with them as I am with uh, so many who have uh, joined us here this evening who uh, have played an important role in the social justice work of the reform movement. Um, and uh, truly with your new senior rabbi, with Josh Davidson, um, you have one of the most respected, admired, and loved rabbis of this generation. Um, fans all over the place amongst his colleagues. Uh, and that speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. Um, it is really uh, a, a real pleasure, Josh, that you are here 
and that we will have the opportunity to continue working together um, uh, here. And uh, it, it is very special to me that you extend this invitation to Al and to me um, to be here together as part of this inaugural year of your rabbinate here. So I'm, uh, I'm going to take a, a different take on, on this. I, I simply want to reflect on where we are now in terms of the social justice agenda. Um, uh, our nation is at a crossroads in deciding some of the most basic issues confronting us, the role of the public sector um, in resolving the problems in our country, um, uh, the, how we will rebuff uh, forces that threaten our religious tolerance and liberty, how we shape our world, our role in an ever-growingly complex world. And the world is at a crossroads in deciding how to navigate the clash of civilizations in confronting the pervasive threat of terrorism in resolving in the face of global climate change and global poverty, whether we're truly committed to making reasonable sacrifices now to ensure that our children and our children's children Indeed, all God's children will enjoy the fruits of God's creation and wealth as surely as do we. And Israel is at a crossroads in finding a way to resolve its differences with the surrounding nations in a way that allows for Palestinians to fulfill their political aspirations even while Israel's government must act day in and day out to secure militarily and diplomatically the safety of its citizens in a world in which messages of delegitimization of Israel and hatred of Israel seem to resound, and in which we hear messages of anti-Semitism that I think most of us thought we would never hear again in our lifetimes after World War II. It is at a crossroads in terms of urgent domestic challenges, um, uh, the, the strains of its uh, vaunted uh, health system and educational system, the growing gap between the rich and the poor, um, uh, the ability of uh, Israeli Arab citizens, of the Bedouins to achieve equal rights with the rest of the uh, country and the growing divide between the Haredim and the rest of Israel, exacerbated by the persistent refusal of the government of Israel to recognize fully the non-Orthodox streams in violation of its own values enshrined in its declaration of independence and of its abiding interests as a Jewish state for all Jews. It is extraordinary, it is, that's Bibi Netanyahu calling to, uh, I, actually, this government has been very good about this issue. For the first time, we have a government in the history of Israel that does not involve some of the ultra-Orthodox parties. And that has allowed this government to try and actually resolve and make improvements in these issues. And we are working very closely with the ruling government and coalition right now to try and get some real breakthroughs on women of the wall, on the questions of marriage, on the questions of government support equally with the reform and conservative Jewish movements as it is with the Orthodox, but it still remains one of the great ironies of all of Jewish history that the only democracy anywhere in the world today that systematically has legal discrimination against the majority of Jews is the government of Israel. And clearly that can't go on for Israel's sake. Um, as well as the Jewish P, the unity of the Jewish people. And our beloved Reformed Jewish movement is at the crossroads. We have been, over the last 40 years, the fastest growing theologically liberal denomination in America. Actually, we've been the only growing theologically liberal denomination in America. And we've been growing by leaps and bounds, in part because of our openness to intermarried families and being one of the first denominations to be open to the LGBT community, but in no small measure because of the legacy of Eisendrath and Vorspan and uh, so many of those who helped shape the social justice agenda of the reform movement, we stand for something. And the polls show in American Jewish life that if you ask American Jews what is the primary expression of their Judaism, whether they are liberals or conservatives, what are their primary expression of their Judaism, 17 to 20 percent routinely say support for Israel. 17 to 20 percent routinely say Jewish ritual or worship. 50 percent say, commitment to social justice, engagement, commitment to social idealism, engagement in tikkun olam, depending on how the poll asks the question. 
It is the great organizing principle of Jewish identity. And if we're going to reach particularly the unaffiliated, who by definition aren't doing the living out their Jewish lives through Jewish worship or ritual or organized uh, uh, prayer or organized study, if we're going to reach them, we have to reach their social idealism and use it as a gateway to bring them back to Jewish life and give them a place to do that work within our synagogues, within our community. And no stream of Judaism understands that more clearly than do we. Why is social justice so central to our common endeavors as Jews today and has been throughout the history of the Reformed Jewish movement? Because God says so. Is it not self-evident that we cannot fulfill our destiny to be a light to the nations, that we cannot respond to God's central call for us to be a holy people if we retreat from the struggles for justice, peace, and equality in our nation or across the globe? We are called for a holy purpose and a holy mission, to be God's partners in shaping a better world. You shall be holy for the eternal your God is holy, God commands in Leviticus. And how does God tell us we can strive to be like God? By feeding the hungry and removing the stumbling block before the blind. By speaking out against injustice and paying the labor a fair and timely wage. By creating courts of justice in a marketplace that is fair and honest. And as Isaiah says, to tear apart, to change the oppressed, to bring the homeless into our homes, to deal our bread to the hungry. But we cannot just deal with the symptoms of social justice that every one of our synagogues does so well. The feeding programs, the homeless programs we have, the programs to improve the environment, the programs at literacy uh, efforts, the programs to give people jobs. Well, there are extraordinary things that go on in our synagogues that go on in this very synagogue. Its philanthropy and its social service efforts are renowned. And you should be duly proud of that. But that is treating the symptoms of social injustice in the country, of the needs of the poor. We have to ask, why are people hungry? Why are people without jobs? Why are people not getting good educations? And we have to begin to address the policies that create those dilemmas and challenges. In other words, we cannot respond to God's call to us to be a holy people without speaking truth to power. And if Abraham, history's first known lobbyist, were willing to bargain control and advocate with God on behalf of the innocents in Sodom, can we do less with human rulers where we see injustice flourish and suffering multiply? Now this vision resounds throughout the entire prophetic tradition. It resonates through the Talmudic creation of the world's first social welfare state. It resonates through 1,200 years of the extraordinary charitable structures of the self-governing Jewish community. And it resonates in Judaism's magnificent contributions to the evolution and values of contemporary democracy. To paraphrase the great Orthodox Jewish scholar Isidore Tversky, one cannot claim to be a God-intoxicated Jew without having an unquenchable thirst for social justice. Now, does that mean that social justice has to be first amongst Jewish values, first ahead of uh, Jewish ritual or worship or spiritual endeavors or Jewish, uh, or Jewish study? No. The Talmud answered that 3,000 years ago. The world is based on three things, Torah, Vadah, Gemilu, Chassidim, study, worship, and acts of loving kindness. They have to be woven together. If not, we would have to answer unanswerable Jewish questions. Which is more Jewish, wearing a kippah or clothing the naked? Which is more urgent, feeding our children in matzah on Pesach or feeding the sorry, starving children in the Sudan? Which is more important, welcoming the Sabbath bride or welcoming the refugee fleeing persecution? Praying with kavanah or speaking out against injustice? 
The heart of an authentic Jewish understanding is that we do not make such choices. A Jewish study inevitably leads amongst many paths to the soup kitchen, and Jewish prayer amongst many valuable things it achieves, prepares us to do battle with injustice, and that Jewish social justice without being rooted in study and ritual is ephemeral and unsustainable. In other words, why are Jews so disproportionately involved in every cause for social justice, liberal and conservative in America? It's what we learn around the Seder table, what we learn in lighting the Hanukkah menorah, what we learn in celebrating the Sabbath as a day of peace, what we learn in the messages of the stories we learn in religious schools, in our Bible stories, what we hear from the rabbis, from our pulpit, all of that shapes who we are. It is a piece of who we are. And it is that that has kept the flame of social justice burning brightly, the door of a door from generation to generation. The bottom line is this, if the Judaism we offer our young does not speak to the great moral issues of their lives, or the great moral issues of the world that we will leave them, it will not inspire their spirit to win their loyalty. If that is the why of social justice, then how about the what? Well, We'll open it up to discussion. You can ask about the issues you want. Let me just make an organizing principle about the what. Most famous dictum in all of Jewish history is Hillel's dictum, if I am not for myself, who should be for me? If I am for myself alone, what am I if not now when? But in Hebrew, that conjunction leaking together the idea of being for ourselves and being for others. We Jews must be both. And that's not just a moral aphorism. It's actually a realpolitik insight. You cannot worry about our particular concerns without worrying about universal concerns. Just take the most passionate issue that many of us hold in our hearts in terms of particular issues, Israel. You cannot worry about Israel without worrying about American military policy. You cannot worry about Israel without worrying about America's foreign policy. Cannot worry about Israel without worrying about the proliferation of chemical and biological and nuclear weapons. And you can't just worry about the proliferation of nuclear weapons in Iran. If Iran today wanted to or stop what they were doing and dismantle everything and let the Israelis come in and inspect, the proliferation of chemical weapons and biological weapons and nuclear weapons across the globe so imperils the world that soon non-state actors, Hezbollah, Hamas, even without Iran's help, will be able to get hold of them if we don't reverse the tide of the proliferation of non-conventional weapons. And you can't worry about Israel without worrying about energy policy, since it's reliance on Arab oil that's manipulated the foreign policy of so many countries across the globe um, over these last decades. And you can't worry about energy policy without worrying about environmental policy. 50 years around, uh, down the road, when we've weaned ourselves of reliance on fossil fuels and Arab oil, we will be giving thanks to those who led that, Jewish environmentalists who helped lead that fight. And obviously, if global warming occurs, there'll be no Noah's Ark for the Jewish community that will preserve us in the face of altering the climate of the globe. The universal and the particular are one and the same. And you cannot worry about oppressed Jews in foreign lands without worrying about religious freedom and tolerance and religious persecution across the globe. Look what's happening in Europe with growing rates of anti-Semitism, with attacks on the right of circumcision and kashrut. Well, we have to win those battles within the schema of fundamental fights for religious liberty and human rights in general. Look what's happening in Ukraine. The desecration of our reform synagogue. Just this past few days. The firebombing of a synagogue 250 miles from Kiev. The murder of two people. In These are real problems that we're facing. Two people walking home from synagogue. These are real problems, but we cannot deal with them without dealing with the broader issues of the Ukraine as well. And what a complicated problem that is. I only wish that there were easy answers to some of the dilemmas America faces in Syria, in the Ukraine, in dealing with Iran. We have to do the best that we can possibly do and set standards that we will abide by and mobilize the world community to deal with these. Not let it be an American problem alone and the universal in a particular are one and the same. 
And you can't worry about anti-Semitism here in the United States without worrying about educational standards, since studies have shown that racist anti-Semitic attitudes correlate with levels of education. The higher the level of education, the lower the likelihood that people will hold racist, misogynist, anti-Semitic views. Now, we know it's no panacea. Too many incidents of our, on our college campuses are filled with a new kind of politicized anti-Semitism that is a danger to Israel in the effort to delegitimize Israel. But it does hold for the 312 million Americans as a whole. The higher the levels of education, the less likely you are to hold the anti-Semitic attitude. So you can't worry about anti-Semitism without worrying about the public school system of America that 80% of our children in America and our Jewish children of America go to. And the universal in the particular are one and the same. And you can't worry about the growing needs of the elderly in our community without addressing general policies like Medicare, prescription drug coverage, pension reform, nursing home reform that so broadly affect the elderly in our nation. The Jewish community is the oldest segment of the American population. Median age of the Jewish community is older than any other religious, ethnic, or racial group. Several years older than the national average. We're watching the graying of America and the whitening of the Jewish community. And we've been practicing zero population growth for three generations outside the Orthodox community. And we tend to live longer. We fit the profile of people who live longer, right? We're educated. We know how to take care of ourselves. In general, we have the means to do it, or our communal institutions are able to help people in need. If we're sick, we all have a doctor in the family to call. We've created an inverted pyramid of an ever-growing number of older people being supported by a shrinking number of younger people through our communal institutions. Halavai, we double our contributions to federations, and we step up and expand the wonderful work we're doing in synagogues like this across the country to help people in need, unless we stand together with the Coalition of Decency that over the last hundred years made a matter that Al alluded to before, a more decent, fair, compassionate, just society to ensure that those people that built this country and paid its taxes and fought its wars have a right to live out their lives with opportunity and dignity, then and only then will we be able to take care of our own and the universal and the particular are one and the same. This is a broad agenda we have, but that's what we Jews are called to do. And at the Religious Action Center, we try to take these in the form of developing programs for congregations to do around the country in terms of social service, but also to speak out on policy issues. We don't pretend that we speak for all Jews any more than the Catholic bishops speak for all Catholics or the Methodists or the Presbyterians or the Mormons um, or the, any of the National Association of Evangelicals speak for all of their people. No association in America, religious or non-religious, speaks for all these members, but we speak for the consensus of our community. And we try to address as best we can, try to address as best we can, the great moral policy questions to help shape America into a fairer society. We do so recognizing, recognizing there can be truth across the political spectrum. Every page of the Talmud is filled with majority and minority opinions. But it never stopped the rabbis by majority vote to decide what the position of the community would be. But we always recorded the minority opinions because the rabbi said explicitly there may be truth in the minority opinion today that will one day make it the majority opinion. You know, so two resources for you. On the back table, I hope those of you who care about these issues will pick up a card and join the 75,000 people in one of the largest, if not outside of APAC, the largest advocacy network in the country, not just Reform Jews as part of the Religious Action Center's network, but Jews from across the religious spectrum who have looked to the center that you have created to help speak for policies that they believe in. And on the other hand, um, Neil Cooper gave me a copy of this, couldn't be more timely, of Commentary Magazine. The cover story is, Be Open-Handed Towards Your Brothers, a Conservative Social Justice Agenda. Read it. I'm willing to bet every liberal in this room will find things in there that they'll say, you know what? This is right too, and we have to lift it up. That's why we have a former um, council general of the OMB from the Reagan administration on the staff of the Religious Action Center. And he's always guiding us to find ways to find common ground on these issues. And we create coalitions across the political and religious spectrum. 
it helps make us as effective as we are. Listen, two weeks from now, or a few days from now, we're going to be celebrating the holiday of Purim again. And you remember those remarkable verses in Esther where Mordecai beseeches Esther to lobby King Ahasuerus on behalf of her people? At first she demurs. And Mordecai challenges, saying, if your people are destroyed, do you think you will be safe? There's no way where Jews will be safe, not even in Israel, until we deal with the problems of injustice and persecution and hatred and prejudice all across the globe. And then Mordecai urges Esther to have courage, saying, who knows whether your elevation to the royal house, to access and power and influence was not for such a time as this. For such a time as this, might not we see the unprecedented freedom given us in North America at such a remarkable crossroads of human history, our attainment of wealth and power and influence beyond the wildest imagination of our grandparents? For such a time as this, and then the Midrash comments that the remarkable woman lobbyist, first woman lobbyist I know of, Queen Esther, decides she will engage on this advocacy on behalf of the values and interests of her people. And the Midrash says, I shall go then, Esther, quoting Esther, I shall go then and God shall lend me God's right hand and left hand with which the universe was created. What a stunning image. It is the only time in the Midrash I've ever seen it. The Midrash always anthropomorphizes God. God does this with the left hand. God does that with the right hand. But only in going to plead for justice to the king do we find the image that our hands are the hands of God. Well, my friends, when you lean down, as so many of you in this congregation have done, to feed a hungry child, your hands are the hands of God. When you march for Israel's security or reproductive rights or racial equality, your feet are the feet of God. As Heschel said in Selma, I felt like my legs were praying. And when you turn your eyes to injustice that others would ignore, your eyes are the eyes of God. And when you listen where others would turn away, your ears are the ears of God. When you speak out against hatred and intolerance and bigotry, your voice is the voice of God. And when you work in whatever way you feel best, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, liberals, moderates or conservatives, to make this world a better place, then as John Kennedy called us to do, you are doing God's work here on earth. And when you, and today, this very day, it is the work that we Jews are called to do. It is God's call to us and our children's as well. And you know, as every Jew does, there's only one answer to that call. Hineni, here I am, here we are, each of us, all of us, part of this great Jewish people, heirs of a commitment to justice that is our richest blessing. I really pray that led by your new rabbi, the extraordinary lay leaders of this congregation, that this congregation and the Jewish people will go from strength to strength to be menders of, for this fractured planet and defenders of our noble faith until soon. Finally, because of what we have done, justice shall well up like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. And we have created the one thing that we are charged to do the world our children deserve. Thank you. We have an opportunity to um, take a few questions about anything you've heard or about issues that are percolating in your own mind that you're curious as to how our movement um, might address them. So, any questions that anyone has? Oh, that's because you put everyone to sleep. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna begin with one then. Think of your own. Um, Al, you, you spoke of um, the drafting of the Civil Rights Act, the conference table of the Religious Action Center. That was in 1964, 50 years ago, was a very significant uh, year in the civil rights struggle. Um, that was the year that you were arrested with Martin Luther King, leading rabbis in St. Augustine. It was the year that just a few days later, in fact, uh, James Cheney, Mickey Schwerner, and Andy Goodman were <coughs> murdered in Meridian, Mississippi. 
that Freedom Summer. Can you talk a little bit about our movement's involvement, both of you, in the struggle for civil rights in this country? <clears throat> Clearly, it was the anvil on which so much of our social justice identity was formed. Uh, but there, there is a point that I want to make. Uh, two points with respect to, to your question. Uh, one, and this flows also from what David said, we didn't plunge into the civil rights movement only out of the goodness of our hearts. We're not that superior. I told you I grew up in Minnesota. Minnesota, when I grew up as a kid, was the capital of anti-Semitism in the United States. <clears throat> the capital of anti-Semitism. Everything had an anti-Semitic restriction. Jews were forbidden even to belong to the automobile club, to belong to the lions, to live in neighborhoods, certain neighborhoods. This was an anti-Semitic regime in the United States of America. Well, go to Minnesota today. Go to Minnesota today. You will see, you know what you'll see, enlightened political debate, enlightened movements, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democratic, a modern state, very little anti-Semitism. What happened? What happened? Partly the civil rights movement is what happened. It wasn't just for them. It was also for ourselves. And once those doors <coughs> so long closed on Jews, once they were open, Jews had the, the brains, the drive, the history, the reverence for education to flood through those doors. We made it in America. It seems to me almost overnight. Every university president was Jewish. The head of every financial regime was Jewish. Jews were everywhere. We made it in America, but partly because the civil rights movement made it in America. <coughs> These are not things you can separate. It was one movement to treat people decently. And one other point, and I'll sh shut up. My voice running out anyway. <clears throat> and I can tell when my voice runs out because I see the look on my wife's face. She says, Stop talking already. They can't hear you. <clears throat> but the other point I want to make about the uh, civil rights movement is that that movement for equal justice galvanized this movement into campaigns we never even dreamed of. Campaigns I, for one, was not even ready for. I was ready for women's rights. I wanted that with all my heart. And one equal justice for, in civil rights led to that. I wasn't prepared as a young person for the revolution of gay rights. I had to be educated. I was just as bigoted as any other kid growing up in St. Paul, Minnesota. The victims of bigotry often become bigots themselves for other reasons. Somebody else to beat up on. I'm proud today, proud, that the movement, David mentioned this too, but I want to spell it out. The movement in this country most united, most effective in the fight for gay rights is this movement. This, and I don't mean the Jewish movement here. I mean the reformed Jewish movement. And I want to say, I'm proud of that. We have gone from one fight for equal justice to an America that believes in equal justice for disabilities, for people who are disabled, for people who are mentally ill. We're a long way from, the, from achieving those results. But that's where, we, that's where we come from. And that's what we represent. And that's why we're so important to the future of American life itself and to the future of, of, uh, of this movement. And why the, <clears throat> the Religious Action Center stands for something unique in this country. There's nothing like it. And people who think this is a, you know, a castle for liberal Jews, liberal Democrats, the man who gave us that building, whose name was Kivy Kaplan, you remember him, Josh, and David will never forget him. I'll never forget him either. One of the most unforgettable people I ever knew. He's the one who said, you have, a, you, want, you have the guts to fight for a religious action center and to do something about these issues, especially civil rights. 
I'll buy you a religious action center in Washington. I'll pay for it. Kitty Kaplan was a conservative Republican. The Kennedy family in Boston was anathema to him. Or a bunch of liberals who found a, a nice nest to do their work. <clears throat> there were a lot of liberals there, but a lot of other people as well. So our significance goes way beyond civil rights. It goes way beyond doing nice things and good things for other people who needed help. We did it for ourselves as well. We helped to change America. And my last sentence is this. As I look out over my career, because Josh referred to one specific instance of my career, instance which people derided, people who didn't like it, derided it as subpoena envy. Subpoena envy, because we all went to jail with Martin Luther King. <clears throat> and I find it ironic, not altogether satisfying, ironic, that I get more requests for interviews or to have a picture taken or to reminisce with somebody about that event. Big deal. We went to jail with Martin Luther King. What was the great crime I committed in American life? We're sitting down at a table in St. Augustine, Florida, with Rabbi Eugene Borowitz and two black ministers. We never even got to order the food. Within a half an hour, we were in a jail in America for sitting down to have lunch. And we were subjected there uh, to something which kind of robbed us of our, of our uh, great self-esteem. We're the great heroes. We probably felt we were doing something heroic. It was gutsy. It wasn't heroic. But when we got to the jail, we said to the jailers, who happened to be, I still remember him vividly. His name was Hoss Manusi. I can see him in front of me right now. Who was the sheriff of the county and the grand legal of the Ku Klux Klan. Same guy, Hoss Manusi. He's our jailer. And we are prisoners for sitting down to have lunch in the United States of America. So we're brave souls and we're religious people, we're inspired. We say to Hosman Usi, we want to be in the same cell. We insist on being in the same cell. You cannot segregate us again. And Hosman Usi said, oh, you think we can't? Bring out the stun guns. Bring out the stun guns. Five stun guns trained on us and all of a sudden, we weren't so ardent. <laughs> we found some way to reconcile ourselves to our private cell. But if I had my way, and interviewers didn't fixate on this event because it was Martin Luther King, not because Al Vorsman, I would tell them the event I'm most proud of is not St. Augustine, Florida. I'm very proud of St. Augustine, Florida. St. Augustine, Florida taught me something I want to say to you. The key players in the fight for social justice in this country are the reform rabbis. Tell you bluntly, reform rabbis. I'm not saying that accidentally. I'm not saying that because I'm surrounded by them. I know what happened. I know what happened in city after city when a call went out to demonstrate, to risk your lives, to speak out, to make your congregation angry because they don't want you saying this maybe. It was rabbis who did it. It's the rabbis who made the difference. It's the rabbis who make the difference with, um, one more sentence, I'm done, with the religious action center. And it's rabbis who will inspire us and lead us. But I want to say what I told you before. My pride is this movement had the guts to gamble its future. This could have blown up in our face. Could have blown up. Let's be honest. Many of the largest congregations in Reform Judaism left the Union for Reform Judaism, abandoned it with all of their dues and all of their money because they said, we don't want to go there. What they meant is not that they don't want to go there on that issue. They didn't disagree with us on the issue. They didn't think this religious action center could be run in a responsible and democratic way. Once we proved it, they, they all came back. But never underestimate the power of the reform rabbi as a catalyst 
for social decency in this country. Yeah, they're, they're, they're on the front line. There, there were no congregations that I know of. I mean, you remember better than I was just a kid then. Um, th there were no congregations that actually left over the creation of the center. And you're absolutely, you're absolutely right that the one that led the opposition to it, Washington Hebrew Congregation, and, and now, is now, and now it's our best friend. Supporter Every one of, of them. Uh, of uh, the Rack's work. Yeah. It, it is true that this congregation and a couple of others over, over Vietnam did, but within a couple of years, they all came back. The country changed. Um, uh, folks, uh, you know, they all came. Uh, they all came back to the uh, uh, the movement. Uh, here. And, and Ronnie rare. Sobel became one of our best friends. So yeah. many people in this it's, congregation. It's really, it's very rare that we've actually ever had a congregation actually leave over a policy. Um, uh, here, you know, we debate it, and uh, in the end, uh, the consensus, the movement, uh, determines where we go. Just two uh, observations about Al. We've gone on longer than we should have on this one um, a question here, but I just want to make two uh, two points. Um, uh, first, Kivy and Emily Kaplan, that Republican he talked about, he was also the last of a whole series of extraordinary Jewish figures who were leaders of the NAACP. He was the president of the NAACP. The last white, the last Jew to hold that um, uh, position. But a number of presidents, the Spingarns and others, prior to that um, were uh, uh, presidents of the NAACP and were legal directors. Louis Marshall, a um, great figure um, uh, here. And, and legal figures like Louis de Brandeis and Felix Frankfurter would advise the NAACP. I mean, the, and, uh, Joel Spingarn was the head of the um, uh, was the head of the legal um, arm for a long period of time. And then Jack Greenberg and others head of the NAACP uh, legal defense fund. Um, both before it split from the NAACP and after. Um, you know, Jews played a very important role in shaping the legal doctrines. And a dear friend of ours, Al Arendt, uh, for any of you who are lawyers, founding uh, uh, partner of Aaron Fox and uh, one of the great tax firms in uh, Washington, D.C., when he worked for the Justice Department, he uh, was one of, when Frank Murphy, the Attorney General, was asked to set up the Civil Rights Division, he volunteered, and he and one other um, uh, uh, Jewish lawyer, Erwin Fishbein, um, were charged to figure out the legal doctrine that allowed the federal government to take jurisdiction over civil rights cases. They wrote a 23-page memo that became the Bible for this, and Al was charged to actually litigate the first cases that won the right of the federal government. Had he not succeeded, everything would have been different and set back decades in uh, America. And there are a hundred stories like that of Jews who did this. And yes, I think there was a consciousness that if that it's good for the Jews if there's no discrimination, but the vast majority of people, the Schwerner chain and, and, and Schwerner um, um, and Goodmans, the 40% the, the of the Mississippi Freedom Riders who were Jewish, all the rabbis who went down, all these lawyers who did this, they did it primarily because they believed it was the right thing to do. You're it right. was a byproduct that it, it helped that, us. But make correct. no mistake about it, um, as Al uh, has said, it is precisely, you know, Al's old enough to remember those days when there were quotas in universities against Jews and Jews were locked out of corporate boardrooms and they were, couldn't get into country clubs. I'm much too young to remember um, uh, those days. And so is everyone else in this room. Um, uh, here. Um, but it was precisely the Warnenberg Accord era that asserted the rights of women and no segment of women based on education and culture were more poised to take advantage of opportunities than no, Jewish women. No question. And the rights of minorities, Jews, Catholics, dissenters, agnostics, atheists, disabled, against the power of the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male um, established in this country that transformed America and then matched with all the civil rights laws that were passed and the women's rights laws and everything is completely reshaped America and Jews moved from the peripheries of American society to the very center of American political, academic, um, economic, and professional lives. Right. Um, this has really transformed America for the better. Now we're very comfortable and we're watching the rollback of some of these things. In the end, it won't be good for America, and I'm proud of our opposition um, uh, to the efforts to roll back many of those great legal achievements. We're coming up on closing time, so I'm going to take the liberty of asking one question. And da David, you're obviously coming up on this very wonderful anniversary, 40 years at the head of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism. I wonder if you might reflect on a few of the most memorable moments that you've had during your leadership. 
Well, uh, I think for Alan and myself, uh, I'll tell you an extraordinary moment. 1976, decided, um, no one had ever done this before, um, to hold a forum to invite all of the presidential candidates yep. to come. Um, we invited uh, uh, President Ford, he did not choose to uh, come. We had all of the Democratic candidates there. It was the first time that Jimmy Carter had ever met Jewish leaders, Correct. national Jewish leaders, Correct. and spoke to them. But we were stunned, we were stunned that at the same time, George Wallace came. Correct. Remember George Wallace in his wheelchair, ran for the presidency? He had never done this. And at that time, I'm embarrassed to tell you, we were not disability um, accessible. And we carried him up in his wheelchair. He had been shot already. He was in um, very uh, bad shape. Um, uh, he <coughs> carried him up in his wheelchair, and he stood, he sat before that group um, there and apologized for what he had said about Jews. It's the first time he had ever done this. It was really just an extraordinary moment. So that would be, that would be one moment. Um, a second moment for me happened very recently. We have been a pivotal group in helping to be a bridge between the religious community and the gay rights community when it comes to legislation. Um, you've heard a lot about religious exemptions uh, uh, and, and the tension between religious liberty claims and, um, uh, and gay rights claims, um, and, or other civil rights claims, women's rights claims, gay rights claims, et cetera. Uh, we've played a pivotal role in trying to negotiate some of the language of some of the contraception um, uh, exemption, the gay rights uh, exemption in the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. You know, there are 29 states in America in which you can be simply fired from a job today, immediately, with no other cause other than you're gay. There's no legal protection in the job for, in 29 states, um, for people based on sexual orientation or gender identity. That's really a tragedy um, in, uh, in America. In 1994, we wrote the first bill. We wrote the religious exemption. It got the Catholic bishops and the Southern Baptist Convention to stay out of the battle. They said, we're not going to oppose the bill. We're not going to support the bill. Um, but we think the religious exemption is good. In 2007, we got a letter from the Seventh-day Adventists, the Catholic bishops, the, um, uh, the Southern Baptist Convention, saying that, again, we're not opposing it, we're not doing it, we're staying on it. Now, it's interesting that four years late, five, uh, eight, five years later, 2007 uh, to today, seven years later, the exact same language was in the bill that went before the Congress, and this time the Catholic bishops did not sign on, but oppose the bill and oppose the exemption because now they broaden their claims of religious uh, exemptions and want it to apply to corporations as well as to uh, individuals, a battle being fought out in the courts and the contraception. Um, but, but this time, our close connections with uh, Orrin Hatch, a Republican uh, senator, got Orrin Hatch to stand up on this bill and uh, to take a position in favor of it. And then uh, uh, Senator Murkowski and, um, uh, and all along um, uh, uh, Mark Kirk of uh, Illinois, Illinois was in favor of the bill. So we got it through committee, and then <coughs> we got it through with a vote of 64 senators. We passed the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, something we've been striving for since 1994. Right? Um, here, I don't know we'll get it through the House, although it's not impossible we will. Some of the key people, including Eric Cantor, have not declared what they're going to do. And we're working very hard to build Republican support. We have enough votes with Republicans um, on the, uh, and, and Democrats on the House side to get this through if we can get it up for a vote. Um, and it'll be seen. I'm One immensely little, proud of that, uh, Josh, um, uh, here. So when I think about some of the times, let me tell you why I love this job. Someone asked me this earlier today. Let me tell you why I love this job. You know, you're a congregational rabbi. Your dad is a great congregational rabbi. Rabbi Sobel is here. Um, uh, here. My dad was a rabbi for 50 years at one congregation. Uh, officiated the life cycle ceremonies of five generations of people. This is people he inspired to become rabbis and uh, Jewish educators and uh, just decent people and synagogue presidents. I mean, it, it, it's just an extraordinary job. There's no job like being a congregational rabbi on the face of the earth. I don't know if you ever thought about that. There's none. There's no job that allows one human being to interact as fully with the lives of others from birth to death 
in good times and in bad times, for those who choose to engage with them. Great teachers have people only for a short period of time. Doctors, therapists, only when people are struggling with, um, uh, with issues. Rabbis engage with people and help shape their lives for those who choose to enter. What an extraordinary profession um, this is. And I love being a congregational rabbi across the park at uh, Rota Sholem in the beginning of my, uh, uh, of my career. But then I went to Washington and honored that Al and uh, Maurice Eisendrath and Alex Schindler offered me this uh, job. And I work on issues. I fight on legislation to increase educational opportunities for people, to provide jobs and huge support for people, to help people stand on their feet, to help preserve the environment. Across the globe, here in America, and I realized, you know what? I worked on this bill for years, and we've passed it. And millions and millions of people's lives are going to be better. They'll never have ever heard of David Saperstein or Al Vorspan. They'll never have heard of the Religious Action Center. They'll never have heard, many of them, of Reform Judaism. But the lives of millions of people are better because of this bill we stopped or this bill we helped pass. When I think about some of the great pieces of legislation that we contribute, I can't think of any greater honor than to represent this that's, that's movement and to do that. this work. So if you ask me, uh, you know, uh, my memories, that above all is a thing that inspires me and renews me day after day after day. And to have such extraordinary people across America in our reform congregations, the rabbis, the lay leaders, all of whom do it, even those who challenge us on the uh, positions and the dynamic give and take of shaping the best position possible. What a blessing. What a blessing it is truly because he rely on my cup runneth over. So that would be my answer. <laughs> David Saperstein's father, Rabbi Harold Saperstein, one of the greatest congregational activists of reform or any rabbinic history, certainly, of his generation. Let me just say personally, um, it makes me so proud to be part of a union of congregations that defines itself not simply as another denomination or stream, but a social movement committed to compassion and justice and the betterment of humanity and ultimately the redemption of God's creation. And it is that way, it is that movement, thanks to the two of you. And we are so grateful for everything you have done and we're so grateful for your being with us tonight. Al Vorspan, Rabbi David Thank you. Thank you.